is that it predicted the murder of Pope John Paul I. What can you tell us about the third prophecy of Fatima? It's a dramatic prophecy. It has to do with a very dramatic war scene in which there's a, a, a city which had been bombed beyond recognition on a hill. There's a bishop in white who is going through the city, seeing cadavers all over the place. He's praying for them. He goes up the hill and beneath the cross, he's assassinated, he's killed by arrows and, and by bullets. We've heard of people are suggesting that the prophecy has in fact been tinkered with. Well, people have scanned very closely what has been said in the past regarding the prophecies, and they've been writing down the dates of when a document was consigned, when it was carried to the Pope, when it was returned, when it was in a particular place. And when they put all these little pieces of information together, which aren't very many, but nonetheless, it seems to come up with a question mark, and so they're, they're wondering what has been kept back. Why would the Vatican do that? Well, there is a school of thought that looks at missing third part of the prophecy as having to do with dissension within the church and specifically within the hierarchy. Sort of uh, corruption in the ranks of the church, that Freemasons are involved. And so their idea is they don't want to divulge it and, as it were, put the Virgin Mary on the stand against the hierarchy of the church. This is an interesting problem for the church. If a person steps up and accuses the Vatican of corruption, then it's one guy's word against the cardinals, bishops, and pope. But if it's written in the Fatima prophecies, suddenly it's the pope's word against the Virgin Mary's, and nobody wants that fight. Whether or not you believe that the Virgin Mary appeared to three shepherd children isn't the issue here. The minute the Vatican deems visions worthy of belief, it's the content of the prophecies that matters. The first prophecy was read by some as a foretelling of the First World War, and it appeared to be accurate. The second prophecy was interpreted to mean the return of Christianity to Russia, and that too came to pass. With that sort of batting average, it's no wonder there was so much anticipation surrounding the release of the third prophecy in the year 2000. It was believed for a long time that the Fatima prophecy was written on one sheet of paper that consisted of about 25 lines of print. What was published in the year 2000 is one sheet of paper, but it's been folded over, so there are actually four sides of print, and they have about over 60 lines of script by Sister Lucia. Now, another thing that comes to light is that Lucia wants the secret to be revealed in 1960. She's very adamant. She says the Virgin Mary wants the secret revealed in 1960, and John the 23rd doesn't do it. He, he passes, and it's not really known why he passes. He never really articulates why. Wow. Sister Lucia, the nun who received the prophecies, wrote down the third prophecy in a one-page letter to her bishop, which was seen by several witnesses. However, when the Vatican released the third prophecy, it was not in the form of a letter, and it was four pages, not one. Skeptics claim the Vatican was presenting something of their own creation in place of the real prophecy. People have speculated widely about it, and so we have different theories. What is the third prophecy about? So the first one really had to do with unbelief in the hierarchy of the church, that you have them using the considerable resources of the church for their own ends, and not for the good of the people of, of God. Some people read the third prophecy as pertaining to John Paul I. The text of the third prophecy, released in the year 2000, reads as follows. The Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling with halting step. Afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. People read the city half in ruins as the Vatican divided. John Paul I ascended to the top of the mountain when he reached the highest office of Pope, and he was soon killed, leaving a trail of corpses in his wake. The year before he became Pope, Pope John Paul I made a pilgrimage to Fatima, and he had an audience with Sister Lucia, which lasted for a couple of hours. Now, after that, he went on vacation eventually with his brother, with other people, and they say that he was very troubled. They don't know exactly what she said to him, but his brother Eduardo said that he was troubled by what Sister Lucia had, had said. Pope John Paul I was elected in 1978. He was Pope only for 33 days, and then in mysterious circumstances, his death came to pass. 
sister Lucia lived to be 98 years old. But we'll never know her full side of the story because like the nun who found the dead pope, the church gave her a vow of silence. But the church wasn't the first group who tried to repress Lucia's message. Way back in 1917, a member of another group found the 10-year-old girl and her prophecy politically dangerous and disruptive, even throwing her in jail to keep her from spreading the word. We are talking about the Freemasons. And yet, it is always the Freemasons, right? But let's focus here. This is a subgroup within the Masons. The Freemasons, it turns out, still have a secret but powerful presence in the Vatican today. And some say this subgroup could even be the force behind the murder of Pope John Paul I. We've been looking into the death of John Paul I, the Pope who served only 33 days. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the circumstances? He was in his apartments just up there uh, on the uh, top floor, second window in. His uh, assistant, Sister Vincenza, takes him his usual morning cup of coffee uh, around about uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock, uh, leaves the coffee there. And uh, she then says that she returned uh, a quarter of an hour later to see that the coffee was untouched. She goes in and uh, she notices the, the Pope, she says, propped up in bed, uh, looking asleep, looking very serene, to use her words. And, uh, but she noticed that he wasn't moving, went there and uh, took his pulse and, uh, and discovered that he was in fact dead. And uh, that's when the, uh, the alarm was raised. We've heard that there was a history, uh, that he had a history of, of heart disease, or that he was... He was actually quite a fit man. He was very healthy. He was in the peak, uh, peak physical condition. Even his, his, uh, his brother said the same thing shortly after his death, that uh, they were, in fact, rather surprised that uh, it was put down as, as a heart attack because there was no history of heart attack in the, uh, in the family. At that time, there was a lot of investigation into the Vatican. There was rumors that senior members were Freemasons and he was going to name and shame these people and, uh, and uh, it would create a furore in the Vatican. Everybody loves the Freemasons, right? The Freemasons are one of the world's oldest and largest fraternities, an ancient brotherhood steeped in secrecy. Formed during the Middle Ages, their distinguished members have included everyone from Winston Churchill to J. Edgar Hoover to Harry Houdini to 14 different U.S. presidents. But before you start thinking that the Freemasons are out to eat your babies, let's realize that not every Freemason is an evil mastermind. Yes, there are smaller, darker factions of the group, one reportedly responsible for usurping political powers and dabbling in the occult. Conspiracy theories abound, leaking the Brotherhood's many rituals to dastardly murders and even satanic orgies. And a number of its members have mysteriously died after revealing their secrets. But I need to be clear here. It is reckless to take broad swipes at any organization, whether it's the Freemasons or the Catholic Church. But yes, if you have a small cabal with access to the most powerful people in the world, it is easy to see why the thought of Freemasons operating within the Vatican is a scary idea. He was going to name Freemasons? Several senior members were, were Masons. Obviously, that's against the Church's canon law. You can't be a Freemason and a uh, member of the Vatican. So, so, so that the Freemasons don't take over the Vatican? The Vatican. The Church has long been at odds with the Freemasons. Pope Leo XII declared Freemasonry the kingdom of Satan. You want to know why? The key requirement to be a Freemason is that you have to believe in God, any God. But it doesn't have to be a Christian God, and that's bad for church business. Also, as a Mason, you need to have loyalty to the Freemasons. But the Pope needs loyalty first and foremost to the church. So where does your loyalty lie? As early as the 1700s, Pope Clement XII declared that any Catholic who joined the Freemasons would be sentenced to death. But apparently, even the death penalty wasn't a strong enough deterrent. Because it was recently reported that the Freemasons have an expansive presence, splitting the Vatican into eight different territories, each run by a different Masonic lodge. This means there are powerful Masonic leaders with agendas potentially separate from the church with the ability to influence major Vatican decisions. So suddenly, the Pope comes by and wants to get rid of all the Masons? You can see why someone would have wanted to take a shot at the Pope first. I can imagine these people you've described uh, wanting John Paul I dead, but would they murder a pope? I mean, wouldn't they be frightened of what would happen to them? Because it's the Vatican, no external investigation was ever really carried out. You don't do an autopsy on a pope. 
you see. You don't do an autopsy, don't on, do a an pope autopsy on a pope ever? And anyone wanting to get rid of the pope would know that they don't normally do an autopsy, so Absolutely. in a way they get away scot-free. Yeah, and also the whole apartment was cleared up very quickly. The embalmers were called within five hours of his death. The domestic staff came in and wiped away every trace. I mean, I've spoken to people who've said it was as if John Paul I was erased very quickly from, from Vatican history. You've got one of the most powerful men in the world has been found dead. No investigation. Within five hours, he's getting embalmed. Certainly, a lot of questions still unanswered. But it's intriguing because within a few months of Pope John Paul I dying, uh, prosecutors, investigating magistrates are also found murdered. Uh, Wait, what? The, the people who were looking into it yeah, were murdered as well? The prosecutors, the Italian prosecutors who were looking into it were also found murdered. An investigative journalist was also found murdered as well. It's all very, very murky. And the key issue is uh, the death of Pope John Paul I. It sounds like he's just the first domino to fall in, in, a, in a huge string of dominoes. Yes. So, when you put all these things together, it does sound like a possible recipe for murder. I, I think very definitely. I'm going to say, it's a huge scandal. It would have been like an, an atomic bomb for the Vatican. The Freemasons inside the Vatican definitely had the access and the resources to cover up the murder of a pope. But we still need to answer one vital question. What exactly was their motive? And to find motive, the first thing you have to do is follow the money. We're investigating the mysterious death of Pope John Paul I, who died just 33 days after taking the post. In fact, many people believe that the Pope didn't die of natural causes, but may have been the victim of a murder perpetrated by the Vatican itself. But could the Vatican really be involved in something as nefarious as murder? We're learning murder may just be the tip of the iceberg. We've been looking into the death of Pope John Paul I, and one of the things that keeps coming up is the Freemasons. Do you believe that anyone would have wanted the Pope dead? Perhaps the motivation would be that John Paul I wanted to reform the Vatican Bank, change the way things were done, and fire some people. So there may have been animosity uh, between Marcinkus, who was head of the Vatican Bank, and the Pope. Paul Marcinkus was a rough-and-tumble American archbishop who was in charge of the Vatican Bank. The Vatican Bank was never meant to turn a profit. Any surplus was supposed to be used for religion or charity. But Marcinkus had some suspicious associations. For one, he was a known member of the Freemasons. And second, he's thought to have ties to the Mafia. And yes, I just said Vatican, Freemasons, and Mafia in one sentence. One piece of news that I have found not very commonly known is that in 1972, Archbishop Paul Marcinkus made the Diocese of Venice sell their bank. And as you know, the Archbishop of Venice at the time was John Paul I. Before John Paul I became Pope, he was in charge of the Venice Bank. Marcinkus forced the sale of the Venice Bank without consulting the Pope-to-be, turning a charitable organization into a for-profit business. That's not just a hostile takeover, that's original gangster. The Pope was upset that Marcinkus sold his bank when the purpose of the bank in Venice was to help, um, shall we say, underprivileged people, and all of a sudden it's going to be uh, completely run over by the Vatican Bank, and Marcinkus had made some uh, ill-advised transactions. Money laundering? I don't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, he mentions that the Vatican Bank purchased a series of properties that went bust. Not to be naive, there have been accusations of laundering by the Vatican Bank up until very recently, in fact. We now know that John Paul I had seen corruption in the Vatican Bank firsthand. So is it possible that the Pope's plan to clean up the streets and go after crooked bankers motivated Vatican assassins to end the papacy of John Paul I almost before it began? You can't write this stuff. Well, okay, you can, but we all know the scariest story of all is the true one. 